Vous m'entendez Il y a quelqu'un Il y a quelqu'un dans cette maison Où est-ce vous Je ne vous vois pas. Où est-vous passé Vous m'entendez Il y a quelqu'un Il y a quelqu'un dans cette maison Où est-ce vous Je ne vous vois pas. Où est-vous passé Vous m'entendez Il y a quelqu'un Il y a quelqu'un dans cette maison Où est-ce vous Je ne vous vois pas. Où est-vous passé Vous m'entendez Il y a quelqu'un Il y a quelqu'un dans cette maison Où est-ce vous Je ne vous vois pas. Où est-vous passé of the Caribbean break upon the shores of Central America. For many years, these fascinating countries have been served by United Fruit Company's Great White Fleet. These lands are principally agricultural.
I'm Chiquita Banana and I've come to say Bananas have to ripen in a certain way And when they're flecked with brown and have a golden hue Bananas taste the best and are the best for you You can put them in a salad Three? No, not yet, my dear That greenish way you're looking means that you are ripe for cooking How about me? No, no, when you are fully ripe, my dear Those little flecks of brown appear Me? You're most digestible, my friend. Delicious, too, from end to end. You can put them in a pie, eye, any way you want to eat them. It's impossible to beat them. But bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator. So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. Bananas are a solid food that doctors now include in baby's diet. And since they are so good for baby, I think we all should try it. Oh! See, 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 see. Bounded by Mexico on the north and Colombia on the south, Central America includes Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Costa Rica, and Panama. Add to this area the important island republics of Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and the British island of Jamaica, and you have encompassed the area known as Middle America. Guatemala City, I say, this is a nasty situation, what? Quite all right, old fellow. Chin up and all that. Carry on. I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say that you really shouldn't treat a fellow man this way. If you like to be refined and civilized, your eating habits really ought to be revised. Suppose I show you by making banana scallops. Take a yellow banana, or even one tipped with green. Cut the banana in pieces about this size. After dipping them in egg, drain and roll in cornflake crumbs or breadcrumbs. Fry about two minutes until brown and tender. Then drain them well and serve hot. So. I'd like to say banana scallops taste to me like very cultured eating. So won't you join me please, old fellow? For this time I am treating. Oh, yes, yes, yes. As long as there's sun, you and your family can go have fun. Because Banana Boat blocks up to 96% of harmful UVA and UVB rays. So you can go, go, go. Confident you're protected from sunburn and long-term skin damage. For big banana and crayon, you'll learn to write a lot of ways. Oh, it's gone bananas. For big banana and crayon, the colors are so bright and gay. Oh, you can learn to color right. <laughs> I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say that they really use refrigerators up this way in the Arctic regions where the north wind blows and ovens more attractive to the Eskimos. Ah, now we're cooking on all burners. When bananas are all yellow or green tipped, they are just right for baking. We just peel them and put them in a baking dish. Next, brush them with butter. Now they are ready to bake in a moderate oven. In about 15 minutes, they should be nice and tender, easily pierced with a fork. Now they are ready to serve as a vegetable. 
So whether it's a cabin, hacienda, or a nickel that you live in, you'll find a dish of baked bananas is one that's pleasure-giving. It's an excitement you can taste. Rich, colorful, refreshingly white, cool, and creamy smooth as the land it comes from. It's the Dairy Queen Banana Split. Come taste the excitement. In the land of Dairy Queen, we treat you well. Everybody look at me and then begin to talk about the Christmas tree. I hope that means that everyone is glad to see the lady in the tutti frutti hat. The gentlemen, they want to make me say, see, see, but I don't tell them that. I tell them, yes, sir. The banana boat's here! Loaded with new banana frosted flakes. Say by the bananas to his frosted flakes. <clears throat> And you should taste the what a difference it makes. Mm, whoa! Kellogg's put real banana bits on my sugar frosted flakes. They're good. Yeah, Tony, they are great. I knew they'd have appeal. It's Kellogg's banana. <laughs> new banana. New <laughs> frosted flakes. Part of this nutritious breakfast. Just plain pies. Simon won't buy my pies anymore. <laughs> I'm Chiquita Banana, and I understand that your pies no longer have a big demand. If you'd like to raise the popularity, remember that bananas give variety. Take an ordinary pie shell, bake for any kind of pie. Aye. Then it only takes a minute just to slice bananas in it. Then add more of your favorite chocolate filling. Cooled, of course. Now flute a banana. Slice and arrange on top. There, a banana chocolate cream pie. Oh, remember that it's easy to have different kinds of pies that use bananas. But butterscotch with vanilla. Hey, you better mind your manners. <sighs> but they're so good. With a banana, and I'm here to reveal the way to spot a great banana is on the peel. Let the blue chip banana boat protects your family in seven conditions. So whether you're sweaty or yes, 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 we are top banana. Hello, amigo. I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say Bananas have to ripen in a certain way And when they're flecked with brown and have a golden hue Bananas taste the best and are the best for you You can put them in a salad You can put them in a pie Any way you want to eat them It's impossible to beat them But bananas like of the very, very tropical equator So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. To have bananas that are fully ripe, you must be absolutely sure. To take them home and let them ripen. Any 
Bonjour, bonjour. shouldn't get yourself run down this way you must have nutrition and to get it right you should really eat some fruit each morning noon and night there are vitamins and minerals in whatever kind you buy they not only are nutritious but they also taste delicious try this take some orange slices and arrange this way next some wedges of nice red apple Peel and slice a fully ripe banana and place the slices around the sides of the plate. Then garnish with salad greens and a bright colored berry or cherry. And there's your banana combination fruit plate. You'll find by eating fruit you'll have more beautiful appearance and complexion. The Mother Nature's beauty treatment to help you look perfection. Indeed, you're right. Banana Creams, the smooth, nutritious way to help manage your weight. Slim Fat, it's your life. Feed it right. School cafeterias meticulous in providing balanced lunches for children report bananas among the most popular and best liked of all fruits. Railroads that haul bananas and other cargo are marvels of engineering. They penetrate jungle and mountain alike. One of the first banana railways took 25 years to build 100 miles of tracks. For breakfast, it is a favorite fruit in every home. That you need a lot of energy to start the day from a bed to breakfast. You will get the punch that you need to keep you going right on through till lunch. And here's a breakfast bowl with real nutrition. Sliced ripe bananas with milk or cream. Mm -hmm. We see what you mean. But wait, here's something else. These are old friends of mine. Whether made of oats or barley, wheat or bran or corn or rye, whether flaked or puffed or shredded, or with other fruit embedded, bananas served with cereal will put a better breakfast on your table. So if you take another healthy, you'll find yourself more able. Yes, 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 yes.
I will saw the little lady in half. <coughs> and now, before your very eyes, I'll make an elephant appear. I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say that I've got a better kind of magic to display. If I could build a mountain on this little plate, well, tell me, Sir Magician, wouldn't that be great? Impossible. First, some chilled and slightly thickened gelatin. Now, some sliced bananas. And a gelatin mold. Make according to direction. Let it gel a little way. Add some ripe banana slices. Just about two cups suffices. Then you pour it in like this and let it set until you're sure it's firmly molded. You'll find it makes a magic mortar. A joy to be beholden and garnished so. Kiss me now. I won't vanish. Carefully boxed to keep them from bruising, bananas are bought by the pound and sold by the pound. Rich in minerals and vitamins, this great American fruit is a familiar commodity in the markets of the world. Breakfast, it is a favorite fruit in every home. Brazilian senoritas, they are sweet and shy. They dance and play together when the sun is high. But when the tropic moon is in the sky, I hide. Do you see anyone who might be interested in me? Maybe tall, dark, and handsome? Not even short, blonde, and fat. Nobody at all. I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say If you'd like to find a man, I bet I know a way Oh, the reasoning is sensible and can't be beat You can always get your man with something good to eat Peel a fully ripe banana And place a pineapple ring around each end Add crisp salad greens and garnish with berries. Then add your favorite dressing and there's a banana pineapple salad that will make anybody's fortune. You can keep your crystal ball because I'm going to buy bananas by the bunches. Bananas? I know my future will be happy. I'm through with playing hunches. And so are we.
Which way are we going? That way? Do you need a coffee? Yes. Um, what am I looking at? 158 spring. 158 spring. We're going here, so we're gonna go south, right? So should we yes. just start going no, west? No, 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 we're going east. No, west. We're going south and... <laughs> the, the blue is where we are. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gallery. Yeah. And that's one. And then 109. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. So 120 will pass first. Okay. Have a good one. Nineteen eighty seven. This is the spot. Ahora aquí hubo un paro, sí, un paro nacional y sobre todo en esta, en esta ciudad. Las expresiones 
frente al paro que usó el gobierno nacional, fueron eh, eh, en una ciudad como Cali, que es de América Latina, la, la segunda con más población afrodescendiente, el trato que se le dio a la protesta social, sobre todo en esta ciudad racializada, fue trato de guerra. ¿sí? Y las violencias ejercidas hacia esos jóvenes, hacia esas mujeres, en esos territorios racializados, fueron violencias con sevicia. ¿sí? Vimos imágenes... De facing the system with a focus on the COVID-19 pandemic response as well as the risks for human rights, biodiversity, climate action, global economic prospects and deepening inequalities. Hi, my name is Luca. Um, I'm going to show you the basement in the Culpa Press. Uh, here it is. Okay, and we're going to go downstairs to our little dungeon. This is our studio. Um, right here you can see Mitsu Okubo's studio. Right there, and we got uh, David Bayes. These are all local artists here in San Francisco. Um, Ross Waitman. And uh, if we come over here, we have our VHS collection. Um, mostly spearheaded by Mitsu. Some books. And uh, I'm gonna show you some of the stuff we're working on for the uh, Printed Matter uh, Fair at NADA coming up on November 30th. Here is some game packaging designed by Hakwa Yo. Uh, mostly from the early 90s. And you can see he was very inventive with die cuts um, and different approaches to video game packaging for PC games mostly. Um, here are some of his sketches and some of his amazing designs. Oh yeah, I only have one hand. Um, yeah, and David's working on laying that book out right now. This is David. 
you can see. I wonder if my camera... Oh yeah, well, here's the sketch portion of the book. That shows him like working on figuring out all these complex die cuts. Yeah. And then this is where we work, where we mostly like... David usually designs all of our books and our desks. And sometimes I work over here and use the uh, the VCR here to take screenshots of films that I then print out on this color video printer. Um, I just ran out of paper, but basically this is like the predecessor of the screenshot. Um, it takes an image from an analog video source and prints it photographically onto paper. Um, and so that is kind of something, a toy that we love playing with. Uh, you can see this is Zalowski's film Possession. Um, that's just playing off the deck right here. And this is a sync monitor. Um, so yeah, so I collect these screenshots and then turn them into a book. And then the other book we're working on is um, Mario Yala and Henry Gunderson's Easy to Be Hard. Um, this is the only thing that I actually have a separate space where it, um, I have a digital press. And so I printed these over there today and just trimmed them down into a sample that then this book will be mounted to a book board, like a children's book. Um, and uh, bound with a Chicago screw in the corner, um, like a uh, like a Pantone book. Um, so we're really excited. Well, an oversized Pantone book. So we're excited about that. Um, yeah, and then you know we're bringing some other stuff to Miami. These are our Rave Flyer books. Um, we're gonna bring our Basement Tapes Volume One. And volume three, um, with some other fun stuff, zines. Uh, oh, and, and last but not least, our Rizzo, where we make these prints with. So yeah, so lots of goodies. Um, we'll see you there. Uh, you want to wave goodbye? <laughs> bye. <laughs> see you soon. All right, I'll say bye too. Okay, bye. That's it. Hello, my name is Linda Simpson, high-profile New York City drag queen. Don't be fooled by my youthful looks. I've been around since the 1980s. Back then, I was one of the few people to hobnob with a camera. My photos throughout the 80s and 90s were random and just for fun, but I got tons of great shots. Wild nightlife, queer activism, pop culture moments, and all sorts of colorful characters joyfully pushing the boundaries of gender expression. For the past several years, I presented my photos in a narrated slideshow called The Drag Explosion, which is also the name of my 250-page coffee table book, released in 2021 and published by Domain. It tells the story of how drag transformed from an underground art form into a mainstream sensation. The art direction is by David Knowles, with text by yours truly, and a couple of special contributors. Performer Lady Bunny, and scholar Tavia Nyango. I'm happy to report the response to the drag explosion has been fabulous, including glowing press coverage. Here's what F Stop Magazine had to say. The drag explosion at its core documents an important moment in not just drag history, but history most generally. Linda Simpson has put forth a brilliant collection of her most personal photographs from an era that has gone dark. What can I say? I'm flattered. It truly is a joy for me to present my photos, and I hope that the drag explosion enriches your life too. The drag explosion is available for mail order from domainbooks.org. Also, check out thedragexplosion.com.
de l'encre sur une page, l'odeur de la colle, des agrafes et des bobines de plastique coloré, blottis, l'attente. Vous pensez à votre père, le temps, le travail. Pause pour nourrir votre chien, piquez à nouveau votre doigt sur cette plante d'agave sur le rebord de la fenêtre. Appelez votre fournisseur de papier. Utilisez une autre adresse électronique pour obtenir une remise sur un nouveau compte. Ajoutez un peu de miel à votre thé tout en passant au crible des échantillons de toile de bibliothèque numérique, du papier marbré et des fils de lin. Faites un zoom avant. Est-ce que cela vous aide Trouvez une police avec cette insaisissable fanfaronnade municipale. Allez, c'est la première chose qu'ils vont voir. Faites des recherches sur les typographes et sachez ceci. En 1959, Herbe Lubalin, Lubalin, a remporté un Grammy pour la meilleure couverture d'album de l'année. Shostakovich, symphonie numéro 5, dirigée par Howard Mitchell. Ah, vous êtes dans le feu de l'action maintenant. Collaboration, expérimentation, l'air frais de la montagne pour ainsi dire. Un nouveau départ, creusé dans la terre comme un, un petit enfant. Un enfant avec les clés de la guillotine. Musique. Bruit. Encore de la musique. Faites fonctionner vos déshumidificateurs toute la nuit. Je veux dire, est-ce que l'encre ne sèche jamais vraiment les livres, ils sont simples, seulement ils ne sont pas simples du tout. Bonjour, je suis Eric Pedersen, Bonjour, je suis le fondateur Eric Pedersen, des éditions fondateur Drum, des Machine. Drum Machine. Drum Machine Édition est une maison d'édition et une imprimerie indépendante située à Ashville en Caroline du Nord, depuis 2018. Nous collaborons avec des artistes, des écrivains, des musiciens, en traduisant leurs œuvres sur la page imprimée. Parfois, nous apprenons de nouvelles astuces en cours de route, comme la production de cassettes ou flipbook en édition limitée. Quoi qu'il en soit, nous y arrivons. Ou nous ne faisons pas tout, mais nous faisons tout correctement. I'm packing, not checking with the word that I say. All you soft MCs, 
Need to step on my way. Those try me or deny me cause I'm number one. And when I rap on the mic, I get the job done cause everything I say, you know it's rough. I'm empty shot key and I gotta be tough. Everybody sing this song.
Shalom Aleichem, welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Director of Communications at the Yiddish Book Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Yiddish Book Center's virtual theater for tonight's program. But before we get started, just a few things to mention. Um, I don't have to remind you to turn off your cell phones, but I do need to let you know that uh, the video and mute functions on your computers will be off for the duration of the program. You may submit questions at any time, via the question panel, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We do ask that you keep comments succinct um, and brief so that I can try to get them answered. Uh, and I should say no comments, please. Uh, question succinct, um, thanks. And this evening's program will run about 30 minutes and will be followed by a short Q&A. And it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's program on behalf of the Yiddish Book Center. We're delighted to host Brett Sokol for the program. Brett is a journalist and editor of Shtetl and the Sun, Andy's Sweet South Beach, 199, uh, excuse me, 1977 to 1980, which is a vivid photographic portrait of the then thriving and now vanished Jewish community of retirees that existed on South Beach during the 1970s. Tonight, he'll be speaking about his newest book, Hello Mada, Hello Fada, Andy Sweet's Summer Camp 1977. It's a companion to Shtetl in the Sun, and it chronicles the summer of 1977 at Camp Mountain Lake. I will spare you the singing of the song, which will now, for many of you of a certain generation, be in your head. Um, welcome, Brett. Can you see me there? I can see you. It looks like oh. you're uh, down in Florida. <laughs> Yes, uh, I actually behind me is one of Andy Sweet's photos from uh, Shtetl in the Sun from 1979. That is uh, Ocean Drive behind me. Uh, I can assure you, you will never find a parking spot like that again today. <laughs> Thanks. So um, thanks for joining me this evening uh, and for bringing Andy Sweet's work to our attention. Uh, and before we get started, I wonder, can you give us a little bit of information uh, about Andy Sweet, his work, and how you came to collaborate? Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, Andy Sweet was a Miami Beach native. Uh, he grew up there uh, and was a, 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 a photographer from a very early age. Um, unfortunately, uh, he was, uh, his life was cut short in 1982, uh, just as his work, uh, particularly his work focusing on the Jewish community in South Beach was really beginning to, uh, to, to win a lot of acclaim and, and, and get noticed. Um, and, you know, for a long time, uh, his photographs weren't seen by anyone, really. Uh, and about two or three years ago, uh, there started to be a little bit of a buzz about his photographs again. His, um, his family, particularly um, his uh, sister, started putting a couple of the shots online just so people could see some of the work that he's done. And that's when I first noticed them. Uh, Letter 16 Press is a nonprofit publishing house, which I run with my partner, Francesco Casal. And we focus on uh, photography, which hits that sweet spot between photojournalism and art. And Andy Sweet's photos just nailed it right smack in there. Uh, they were both incredibly beautiful, uh, sometimes transcendent, sometimes sad, sometimes laugh out loud funny, uh, but they worked on an aesthetic level, but they also worked on a historical level. They told a really important story about South Beach uh, in the late 1970s, a story that I don't think had really been properly told in a visual sense. Uh, and so that's when we reached out to the family because it sort of amazed us that people were getting really excited about these photos but there wasn't a commercial gallery that wanted to step in and, and create, uh, you know, exhibits and, and a book of them. And we found that it was sort of the, the age old story of the art world and, and one that explains why Letter 16 Press exists is that the negatives were all gone, which meant that um, all that was, was around were some of these uh, prints and in some case only test prints. So they had to be uh, painfully, painstakingly restored. There needed to be a lot of restoration work, color correction, all kinds of, of important time consuming and very expensive archival work. And uh, commercial galleries at that time just didn't want to spend the money on it. Uh, and that's where we stepped in. We said, well, we're a nonprofit. This is why we're here. Um, it's about taking on projects like this that really need to be seen. Uh, and so Shtetl in the Sun was the first book that we did of Andy Sweet's work, which came out last year. And in the process of going through his archives, we also found this second body of work that really hadn't been shown. 
And it was a set of photos that he took during the summer of 1977 when he was a counselor at Camp Mountain Lake in Hendersonville, North Carolina. He'd actually been a camper there himself starting in 1968, then a counselor, and then again during the summer of 77, a counselor and a, a, the photography instructor for the camp. And these photos really captured the, the sort of otherworldly state of what summer camp is like then and now in a sense where it's this self-contained alternate world of uh, where the, the sort of the adult figures are essentially 18 and 19 and that's pretty much it. There's really no other adults there. Uh, and all of the, the teenage rites of passage that you know, we're also used to at this point are all sort of laid out there. And he captured it all on film. And we thought, you know, that's got to be the second book that we do. Uh, and we started work on uh, collecting a book of those photos, the book that is Hello Mudda, Hello Fada, before the pandemic. At the time when we started working on the book, we thought, well, this is going to be perfectly timed for summer camp. It'll be a celebration of summer camp then and now. It's taken on a little bit of a bittersweet quality because summer camp, as we know it, is, is obviously on hold right now. But I think that this book and the photos in it, some of which we're going to show everybody this evening, are really a wonderful snapshot of this golden era of summer camp. Well, we were lucky enough, um, Susan Bronson, our executive director, brought the exhibit of Shtetl and the Sun to the Yiddish Book Center oh, about a year or so ago. And it, it is an incredible body of work and really very evocative. So um, I have to say that I'm incredibly excited that you're going to take us on a little bit of a tour um, through the second book, Hello Moda, Hello Fada. Um, and it's interesting to see because it sort of bookends in a way. I mean, you've got the chronicle of retirees and you've got this sort of beginning of adulthood here at camp. <laughs> so um, as they say, on with the show and yeah. uh, eager to see the work. I do also just want to say it was such a treat to see the exhibition of Shtetl and the Sun photos up at the Yiddish Book Center. Uh, it really brought home to me uh, in a very visceral way the energy that was in those photos because uh, in the late 70s in South Beach, you would hear Yiddish in the streets as much if not more than English. And so it was really wonderful to have that snapshot of that whole world up at the Yiddish Book Center as part of the whole continuum of history that, that the Yiddish Book Center is really showcasing. It was, it was really special. I, I hope people in the audience got a chance to see those photos there. And now you're gonna transport us back to the summer camp of some of our youth. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, Andy Sweet first attended Camp Mountain Lake as a camper in 1968 and then as a counselor and a photography instructor, teaching kids who were essentially younger versions of himself, uh, secular Jews from South Florida straddling the lines between societal insiders and outsiders. Uh, they were comfortably middle class, yet raised within a deeply conservative region, still filled with lingering traces of open anti-Semitism. Uh, the setting was an ideal one for observing moments both profound and offhandedly joyous. For eight weeks every summer, 300 kids and 100 staffers constructed their own entirely self-contained world. Uh, Sweet and the Hasselblad camera that hung around his neck were simply part of the everyday scenery, which allowed him to capture it all on film without making any of his subjects self-conscious. Uh, the end result which formed the basis of Sweet's MFA thesis, and in an expanded version, this book, Hello Mudda, Hello Fada, provides a knowing portrait of the era's fashion, pop culture, and frank expressions of adolescent sexuality. Uh, set against the cherished rituals of camp life, from the parade of trunks as 300 campers arrived at Mountain Lake's rural setting, to the end of August Dionysian frenzy of color war, Sweet's photos tell a classic coming of age story one full of awkward crushes, intense friendships, and the kind of deep truths that emerge over late night campfire toasted marshmallows. It would have been easy for Sweet to continue in this vein, uh, digging deeper into youth culture, the secret worlds of teenagers establishing in today's art world parlance an easily recognizable brand, but he was already moving in an entirely different narrative direction, planning his return to his hometown of Miami Beach and envisioning his photographic love letter to the city's elderly Jewish community. 
Those photos are collected in the book, Shtetl in the Sun. But first, let's go back to 1977, Hello Mudda, Hello Fada, and the golden era of summer camp. Uh, in her introduction to Hello Mudda, Hello Fada, uh, the New Yorker staff writer, Naomi Fry called Sweet's pictures, quote, a celebration of bravado and gawkiness. Now, that might seem like a contradiction until you look at this photo with its young woman learning how to become comfortable in her own skin at the very moment Sweet focused his camera. Uh, as I mentioned, almost all of the campers here were from South Florida, something alluded to by the signpost you see at the center of these three kids. Uh, there probably aren't too many other signs in rural North Carolina then or now telling you which way Miami is. Uh, but aside from the content of the photo, you also get a sense of Sweet finding his way towards his sense of composition here, incorporating figures as well as the landscape in a very natural way. Well, who doesn't love the Fonz? Uh, pop culture references aside, you can practically smell the whiff of hormones coming off of this photo. Uh, I think the, uh, the knee-high tube socks here say it all. There's a, a Judy Bloom novel just waiting to unfold from this particular photo. Uh, we've also had a lot of people asking about the uh, Camp Mountain Lake t-shirts that you see in, in this photo in particular. Um, we made up a small number of replica t-shirts of them just like this. Uh, you can get those for sale on our website uh, along with the books. The website is letter16press.com, letter16press.com. One of the things that really struck me as I was going over the photos in this book was how young so many of the kids were. And I know that I was told that the youngest age of the campers was five years old, but it was just really something to actually see all of these five-year-olds off away from home for two months. Uh, and it was kind of hard for me to imagine today parents taking their five-year-old and sending them off uh, to summer camp for, for two months away from, from really their families. Uh, and I brought this up with my mother and I said to her, I said, could you imagine parents taking a five-year-old and sending them off alone for two months away from home? And my mom got real quiet and she said, Brett, you know, your grandparents, Nanny and Poppy sent me off to summer camp when I was four. So <laughs> there you go. Here's another jarring bit of history. Uh, in 1977, no one thought twice about handing out live ammunition to a bunch of children who were scarcely bigger than the rifles they were holding. And I can tell you from personal experience, when I was in summer camp myself in the early 1980s, we were still shooting these same 22 caliber rifles. I think nowadays in 2020, most parents would probably lose their minds at the thought of a whole bunch of, of seven, eight, nine-year-olds being handed loaded rifles with a single 18-year-old as adult supervision. But there you go, summer camp in the 70s. This is a really great example of Andy honing his sense of intimate portraiture. Uh, if, if you've seen Shtetl in the Sun, you know that this really became his signature type of shot, really establishing this kind of warm relationship with his subjects. And he's He's really getting it down here with, with this particular camper. So, Brett, I'm going to interrupt you for a second, as we agreed you were going to let me do. <laughs> um, just to say, yeah, what's astounding about this shot is, and, and when I first saw it, um, it's uh, the posture of the, the kid is so much in keeping with a lot of the shtetl in the sun. And it feels like his portraits um he really connects and he gets uh you know sort of the the physicality of a person they they relax into the shot and do you have any idea you know like for this um how he worked with the subjects sure well i, I think there's two parts to that the first part is because he had been involved with this camp for so long and he was there every day as their counselor, as their photography instructor, he had already established relationships with these folks. He, these weren't strangers. He wasn't parachuting in as some kind of reporter for the day. So they knew who he was. I think in a lot of cases it was, oh, it's Andy again with his camera. Uh, I think the second part of this is, is the way he shot using a Hasselblad camera that would hang around his neck. And instead of bringing it up to his face, 
he would look down into it and focus. And so as he's taking the shot, he's actually making eye contact with the people that he's shooting. And it creates a, a really intimate type of relationship between the photographer and the subject, as particularly if, if it's someone who's maybe not used to being photographed, whether it's, it's in this case, a, a, a camper, that you, you create a link, a kind of, of, uh, of, of a bond there that is really special. And I think it came through in his photography, both these shots and also again in the shtetl and the sun shots. He was working the same way with the same camera. Uh, again, here's another photo that in today's <laughs> virus environment seems like it's another world. The idea of, of jumping on top of people in a pool. Uh, we're pretty sure that this shot is right after Color War was concluded. And if you're scratching your head over Color War, uh, this is an annual ritual that would occur at almost every summer camp then and now. Uh, and it basically happens right sort of in mid-August, mid to late August, towards the end of summer camp, when uh, every bunk throughout the camp would be divided into two teams, which would compete against each other. And it's almost like a civil war <laughs> within the camp. Uh, and the campers and the counselors alike would get whipped up into this emotional frenzy that would go on for three or four days. Uh, and at the end of it, um, as you can see in this photo, it's, there's this cathartic release that it's all over and we're all getting back together again. And you can see that's why some of the people in the pool have their clothes on. They probably all just jumped in uh, and people are hugging. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I don't use the word catharsis lightly. It's, it's, I think, as anybody who's been through color work can tell you, it's the closest you can come as a child to having a sort of, you know, almost out of body experience over the course of three or four days. Uh, I like to think of this trio of kids as, as like the Jewish Katzenjammer kids. Uh, and again, you see Andy working on his sense of portraiture. Um, on a fashion note, uh, if any of you out there recognize those Adidas sneakers you see on the, the left and the right hand side children, and you have those sneakers in your closet, they are worth a small fortune now. <laughs> so hold on to those. This is a bit of an anomaly in Sweet's work. He rarely shot action photos. Again, portraiture was what he was all about. Uh, but I think in this case, he just couldn't resist. I mean, it's, it's the kind of iconic summertime shot of water skier in midair. Uh, this is inside one of the bunks. And there is something about the look on the counselor's face that really says it all. <laughs> it's, it's probably late August. Uh, there's a certain kind of world weariness that I think only a 20 year old can have at this point. Uh, he is not smiling, um, but it, it gives you an idea of, of both the sort of camper counselor dynamics. And it's also a reminder that uh, as a camper, we worshiped, absolutely worshiped these counselors. We thought that they were you know beyond the elders of the community uh, that everything that they told us was like the template for how we wanted to grow up and live our lives and it's it's sort of almost ridiculous in a sense as you get older and you realize that these authority figures were 18 19 years old what did they really know but to us at that time they knew everything and i think you see the same thing going on here and brad i'm gonna stop you for another quick question about this one it's so interesting because I mean, it's an awkward time, I think, uh, in life, and you don't always want to be photographed. And yet he seems to have been able to get everybody to smile and also <laughs> wonder if he set the, does, do you know if he set these shots up or if he just happened, I mean, a Hasselblad, you need to spend a little time framing. So how much do you think he directed any of this? A very, you know, a little bit. And this is one of the things is, is he was really, on the one hand, he didn't do a lot of necessarily like impromptu surprising people. Every, almost everybody being photographed would know for the most part that they were being photographed, but he really didn't like to arrange people per se. Uh, and one of the things we noticed as we were going through his contact sheets is, you know, with a lot of photographers, they would spend an insane amount of time trying to get that certain shot down. So you might see 15 or 16 different versions of one particular shot, not with Andy. If you saw two versions of the same shot, it was a lot. Uh, he would just move around a lot. If he saw something that caught his eye, he would maybe sort of holler out, go, hey, 
hold on a second and get the shot. And I think in this case, he was probably just walking through the bunks. People were hanging out. Uh, there were probably, as you can see, there's, you know, the kid is literally jumping on the counter's back. So the kids in the top bunk were probably goofing around and the kids in the bottom might have been nearby. And he just said, hey, grab a seat. Let me get this shot. Bang. That was it. Moved on. And the same approach happened in Shtetl in the Sun. Uh, when we look at those contact sheets, it was the same thing. There would, there would be one, one take of a particular shot. If he would get it, move on. If he didn't get it, it wasn't going to happen again. He just moved around, saw things that caught his eye, snapped it, kept moving. That was his whole modus operandi. Uh, I thought this one was a really nice shot to close on because it really speaks to that moment uh, of, of a camper's age when you're sort of becoming comfortable in your own skin. I mean, Wearing headgear is not a pleasant experience, especially having to wear it at summer camp with people around. You can easily imagine it making you a source of ridicule. And yet, this kid is just owning it. He doesn't seem to be self-conscious about it in any way whatsoever. And I think it's just really wonderful that he was possessed with this this sense of self-confidence. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Andy did not write down the names of any of these kids. So we're not quite sure who this is, but I have absolutely no doubt that wherever he is, he went on to do some really amazing things. Uh, we're going to turn now back to Andy Sweet's hometown of Miami Beach, uh, where he returned as soon as he'd received his MFA at the University of Colorado at Boulder in the fall of 1977. As I mentioned, the cam shots that we saw, a number of those formed the basis of his MFA. As soon as he got it, he got in his car and drove back to Miami Beach and was focused on uh, his mission as he saw it, which was to document the Jewish community in South Beach at that time, which he knew was not going to last. And he felt it was absolutely imperative that he get it down on film. Uh, and I mentioned before, uh, what really struck me about these photos that you see that we're going to show you in a moment that are in this book, Shtetl in the Sun. And what I thought was so important was that it filled in a certain historical picture that we didn't have before. We know what South Beach in the 50s and 60s looked like with its images of the Rat Pack in full swing, I'm thinking Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin out on the town and later Jackie Gleason filming his weekly variety show there, all while tourism boomed. And we know what the 80s looked like as the televised mayhem of Miami Vice became all too real. The 90s are also fixed in the public eye as South Beach was reborn once again um, as the American Riviera with seemingly endless amounts of glitz and glamour. But the 70s remained somewhat blurry. Uh, there were about 20,000 Jews crammed into nearly two square miles at the southernmost tip of Miami Beach. Many were originally from New York, or they were Holocaust survivors. And yes, the overall feeling was that of a shtetl, the tightly knit Jewish settlements that defined so much of pre-World War II European Jewry. And as I mentioned, you could hear Yiddish in the streets as much as you would hear English then. Uh, and when we do visualize that time, it's often with an eye roll or a joking reference to South Beach as the Yiddish-speaking section of God's waiting room. When I moved to South Beach myself in 1999, I labored under that misconception like so many other people. And I think what Andy's photos show us is that nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, what you see in his photos is a, a, a people that are doing anything but waiting around to die. Andy's photos create a vivid portrait of a community that is just filled with life. Every day he went out and he photographed the daily rhythms unfolding all around him. Uh, he captured people who still had plenty of living, and laughing, and loving to do. Uh, this book, Sun Dappled Tribe, and the world that they built is unfortunately long gone, as you mentioned. Uh, but thanks to Andy's work, it's not forgotten. Uh, here you see Andy fully at home between two sets of people that could have just as easily have been his own grandparents, uh, which is key to how Andy got such intimately moving shots, whether it was at summer camp or again, back here on South Beach. He grew up here in Miami Beach. He knew the community. He knew the people there, and they instantly felt comfortable with him. It was like having a grandson come around to visit. It just, in this case, the grandson had a camera around his neck. 
Uh, this is the Leslie Hotel on Ocean Drive, uh, and it's a great shot of what is affectionately known as the porch sitters, which were people who sat on the porch of the hotels where they were staying. Uh, and porch sitting was a big aspect of the social scene then, whether it was getting together to kibitz to talk about politics, to talk about what was going on in your families, or just to take in the daily flow of the passerby. Uh, you hear this phrase again and again, the porch sitting life. There is a lovely story behind this couple that we were told um, as we were putting the book together. Uh, everybody on the beach was very familiar with them. Uh, each of them had lost their spouses in the camps in Europe during World War II. After the war, they moved from Europe to South Beach and they met each other while walking on the sand one day and they became instantly inseparable. Uh, even wearing the matching swimsuits that you see in this photo. Now, this image might seem a little incongruous. A uh, Hasidic Jew is hardly dressed for the weather on South Beach, yet, ironically, it's probably the one photo in the book which could have been taken yesterday as much as back in 1979. Uh, the Hasidic community in Miami Beach is bigger today than ever before. Uh, it was a minority in the late 70s. Today, they have a vibrant local presence. Uh, even beyond the striking colors here, what's really apparent in this photo is Andy's sense of composition. The way his subject's pink dress picks up the pink buildings in the background and this tableau of small objects, the Bijan Frise dog resting at the woman's feet, the bottle of Coca-Cola in her hand. Um, and again, as you mentioned, how he set up these photos, it's important to note, he didn't stage this. He would have been walking around and he probably noticed her and he just said, hey, could I take your picture? Just you know, stop for a moment. And that's how this came about. He was very, very much about capturing spontaneous moments. He really saw himself as a documentary photographer, not someone trying to create artistic moments, but someone who was trying to capture the realities of life, in this case, the realities of life on South Beach in the late 70s. Uh, this is a great microcosm of South Beach, circa 1979 on Ocean Drive. People walking, lounging, posing, right across the street from rows of porch sitters who no doubt were looking back on this vista of humanity. Uh, this is daily life on Washington Avenue. We're at the corner of Washington Avenue and 7th Street here, about two blocks from Ocean Drive. You see a bakery, a bar, a bank, another hotel, uh, no doubt filled with long-term guests then instead of the weekend warriors of today. Uh, one of the hallmarks of this period is the lack of self-consciousness that people had about showing skin. Today on South Beach, youth is everything. But in the late 70s, no one thought twice about bearing your flesh, regardless of your age. The sun's out, the air's warm, enjoy it. This is one of the daily impromptu jam sessions in Lummis Park, right off of uh, Ocean Drive. And I think it's important to note that this wasn't a special event, there wasn't a, a, a planned concert, it wasn't a holiday. This was Tuesday in February. It's just another day on Ocean Drive in South Beach. People would get together for jam sessions. If you could play guitar, you brought a guitar, an accordion, a squeeze box. If you could sing like this woman, you get in the middle and you sing. Um, and again, it's a great example of what daily life was like down there, people getting together. It's this kind of, of vibrant sense of, of life <laughs> going on in a regular sense. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's, it was really eye-opening to me to see photos like this because, you know, for my generation growing up, it's not how we were told uh, South Beach was in the late 70s. And again, we were very wrong to be told a certain thing, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to help dispel those myths by putting these photos out in the book. Brett, quickly with this photograph and, and some of the ones that preceded it, it seems as though he will he captured moments that were happening. Was he much um, sort of immersed in this community so that he was there constantly? And these yeah. are, yeah, okay. That, and this is how he saw it as his job. Every day he would get up, 
Uh, and with, he would work with Gary Monroe, who was another photographer that he was very good friends with, uh, who was also at um, University of, of uh, Colorado at Boulder, also getting his MFA. Uh, Gary would shoot in black and white. Andy would shoot in color. And as Gary tells it, uh, basically, you know, they, they were able to get a, 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 an NEA grant to, you know, get started on this. And every day, Gary would wake him up <laughs> and they would go out and they would wander South Beach looking for things to shoot. And because they were there every day, and people got used to seeing Andy. Like, like I mentioned, I think for a lot of people, it was like, oh, our grandson's here again. He just, he has a camera. Uh, and so he was able to, to, you know, again, create that intimate connection through both the familiarity of his presence. I think also the fact that he was, look, he was a nice Jewish kid who grew up on Miami Beach. This wasn't foreign territory for him. This was, this was his hometown. This was his home community. Uh, and then you add, add to that the fact that he's shooting with the Hasselblad. He's talking to people as he's taking the photographs. He's making eye contact with them. Um, he's, he's establishing that, that sense of intimacy that comes through in these photos that I don't think a different kind of photographer working differently would have ever been able to get. Um, Speaking of, of intimacy, again, uh, in this book's introductory essay, uh, the novelist Lauren Groff wrote that, quote, there's a glimmer of humor in the faces that sweet photograph, which makes his best photos feel like a loop of generosity. Uh, the photographer's own warmth warming the subject so that she beams back into the camera lens and warms the viewer. Um, I think you can see that kind of glimmer right here in this shot. Uh, here are three absolutely fabulous ladies. <laughs> Enough said. Cabana life. Uh, some folks took the decorating of their pool cabanas very, very seriously, treating them as public extensions of their private living rooms. I will tell you there is nothing accidental about the riot of patterns here that this gentleman chose or the array of trophies that you can see lined up against one wall. Uh, you are meant to see those. Uh, now, you might think that the photos hanging on the wall behind these three women were simply photos of their grandkids. But if you zoom in, you'll see that they're actually pictures of Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat signing the 1979 peace treaty with President Jimmy Carter looking on. Uh, it's a reminder that current affairs and politics were still on everybody's mind here whether they're relaxing by the pool or debating in the park. Uh, Andy spent weekdays roaming South Beach and taking photos for himself, but weekends were given over to paying work, like shooting uh, this bar mitzvah party at Temple Emanuel on Washington Avenue. Um, I think this picture is also a reminder that even as South Beach was being defined in the late 70s by its older population, there was a younger generation of Jews that were coming of age there at the same time. Uh, and they're still there. I, I st <laughs> still call South Beach home myself. Uh, our suit lapels get smaller, but we endure. And uh, Andy Sweet's photos can help us pass this historical memory on to the next generation. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy that I got a chance to share these photos with everybody. Uh, and I'd love uh, if people have questions, we could take some of the, the questions. That'd be great. Andy, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, it's, it's really a wonderful, wonderful collection that you've brought out and um, been able to share Andy's work. So I, I do have some questions for you. Uh, so um, one, let's see, to get started, um, well, let's let's go with one of the harder questions, which is, somebody <laughs> would like to know um, actually what happened to Andy Sw Andy Sweet. Ah, it's it's really tragic. Uh, South Beach really began to change in the early '80s. Uh, there was a skyrocketing in crime, and unfortunately, Andy himself became a victim to that. He was murdered in his home. Uh, in 1982. He wasn't even 29 years old yet when it happened. Uh, it's, it's, it's really quite sad. There's a lot more detail about this um, in the book itself, Shtetl and the Sun, 
but suffice to say it's 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 on the one hand it's 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 so wonderful to look at these photos that he did give us both from summer camp and here on south beach um but at the same time it it, it has this this sad aspect to it because uh, we, it makes me wonder what else he would have gone on to shoot what more he would have he would have brought to us because he was developing so quickly i mean that's what's so amazing to see him honing his skill sharpening his eye just from the summer of 77 even into 1978. It's just, he was just developing by leaps and bounds. Um, and the other question is, was he self-taught? Uh, <laughs> no, no. I mean, he, he, he was very focused on, uh, he, he began learning himself. Um, he actually then became so dedicated to photography that he essentially crashed his uh, sister's photography class at University of South Florida. He wasn't formally registered there. He just started showing up uh, and he had such an aptitude for it that they let him enroll uh, in the class. And then he went on for his MFA uh, at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, and then from there, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. It's, it's, and again, I talk about this a bit in the, uh, the forward to Hello Mata, Hello Fada. But, you know, a lot of art students today, they, they graduate say, from an MFA or, or, or if they don't go to school, they're sort of the early part of their career, their 20s is about figuring out who they are, the kind of art they want to make, and how they want to make it. Andy had an amazing sense of, of confidence in himself and direction. I mean, he, there's a statement that he wrote with his MFA where he essentially laid out the rest of his life, that he knew what he wanted to do. He saw himself as a documentary filmmaker. He was only going to shoot in color, not black and white, which today seems, you know, obvious in... 1977, that was a very radical move. Color was not taken seriously at all by the art world, uh, or even in a lot of photojournalism. Color was for advertising and for the fashion world. If you considered yourself a serious artist, you didn't shoot in color, you only shot in black and white. Um, a lot of, of museums wouldn't even buy any color photos for their collections. In his, his own alma mater, had a, a, a museum attached to it, the University of South Florida. And at that time, they would not pick up any color photography. They just didn't take it seriously. And it's, again, it's a testament to the sense of direction that he had that in his mind, it was, well, they'll catch up <laughs> because he felt that if you're going to be a documentary film uh, photographer, then you want to capture as much detail from life as you can. And that means shooting in color, which is what he did exclusively. Um, and, uh, you know, he immediately, literally the day after he got his degree from University of Colorado, he got in his car and he drove back to Miami Beach uh, where he met Gary Monroe and they began shooting and documenting the whole community there on South Beach. They just, again, it's, it's sort of amazing the, the, the sense of direction that he had. Do we know what photographers inspired him? Uh, yes. Um, uh, uh, he actually, it's, it's interesting. Um, Mary Ellen Mark was a, a little bit older, but was a photographer whose work he saw. She came down to uh, do some of her own shots on South Beach, and he sort of showed her around a little bit, and they became very, very good friends. Um, so it was, I, I think she was a little bit of a mentor to him. There are some fun shots in Shtetl and the Sun of Mary Ellen Mark herself um, as a photographer. Uh, and I think, again, he was really inspired by a lot of the, the color photography that was then just coming to the fore in the late 1970s, not necessarily getting a lot of respect uh, from the art world, but that he thought was, this is it. This is the most important stuff going on right now. Everybody else is just going to have to catch up. I mean, these two bodies of work are very Jewish uh, focused. Um, do you know if that was sort of primarily what he was interested in was chronicling that part of the scene? I, I think for him it was it was the cultural aspects of it. I mean one of the things that he wrote about in his MFA was that he thought that a photographer shouldn't just be parachuting into a cultural milieu that they don't understand. So for example he shot the summer camp because he understood it. He'd been there as a camper you know, since 1968, and then as a counselor all the way up to 1977. So he understood both the people at the camp, the daily rituals of life, the daily rhythms, 
what it meant to be one of those kids that he was now shooting, what it felt like to be in their skin. Um, and by the same token, when he came back to Miami Beach, this was a community he'd grown up in. This, this was his people, <laughs> it was Amish. He, he understood it and that's why he shot it. I don't think it was, again, so much of the religious aspects as the cultural aspects, because again, Camp Mountain Lake was, you know, 95% Jewish, but it didn't identify itself as Jewish in a religious sense. You know, no one wore a kippah. There were no services per se. It was, the Judaism was um, implicit. It was almost sort of, it didn't have to be spoken about. I think uh, certainly for those kids, I mean, I mentioned, you know, almost all those kids came from the South, particularly South Florida. And even in 1977, uh, there was still a lot of anti-Semitism around. And so this was, this was a safe space for a lot of kids. I don't think anybody ever said that out loud, the way we use that phrase today, but it was just very comfortable for everybody to come together. I mean, there's a reason why kids are schlepping from Miami to North Carolina every summer. It wasn't, it wasn't a short trip, but people felt that this was the place they wanted to be. Um, I think the kids are still finding this today. There's still lots of camps that uh, don't identify themselves as necessarily being a Jewish camp, but the overwhelming majority of the kids there come from Jewish backgrounds. And again, it functions as a very comfortable place at a time when the definition of being a teenager is being uncomfortable in your own skin. So this is a place to work out some of that. And the last question um, before we, we leave you on South Beach <laughs> um, is, is there more work? There, there is a, a wealth of photos by Andy. Um, we've tried to pick out a lot of the best ones, uh, both for Shtetl in the Sun and for Hello Mata, Hello Fada. What I would tell folks is if you go to our website, which is letter16press.com, uh, there's a mailing list there you can sign up for and we'll keep you posted on new books that we're putting out. We also have prints by Annie that are for sale. Like I, I mentioned, we're a nonprofit publishing company. We've created a fundraising edition that helps us to keep putting out books of Miami photographers. Um, we've got, like I said, <laughs> if, if you want a Camp Mountain Lake t-shirt, we've got those there as well. It's letter16press.com, letter16press.com. Uh, and um, uh, that's the best way to keep posted on future doings of Andy's suite. Um, and again, I, I wanna thank everybody out there for, for tuning in, for joining us. It's really a treat to be able to share these photos with everybody. And, and I wanna thank the Yiddish Book Center for, for hosting this and for continuing to, uh, to do great events like this. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give, I know this is a plug for you guys and it might make you cringe, but for anybody out there who has not been to the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, when they do open up again, and it's safe to go to museums and institutions like that, go. <laughs> it is really, really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, thanks for bringing this work to us um, and for telling Andy's story, um, which is uh, a universal story in many ways, what he's chronicled. So again, for those of you who are joining us today, um, we thank you for that. Um, the book is Hello Mata, Hello Fada, and it's available at Letter. 16press.com and uh, the other book is available there as well and you'll find information about Andy Sweet. So thanks to all of you for joining us again this evening. Um, I would like to thank our producer Sarah Bleichfeld who is behind the scenes and making all this magic work for us. Thank you. Um, tonight's reading is part of or tonight's presentation is part of an ongoing series that the Yiddish Book Center is offering virtual programs every Thursday night at seven. Next week, we hope you'll join us when Kenneth Turan talks about Jews in Hollywood. Uh, that program is at again at seven next Thursday. You'll find information about that and all of our upcoming events by visiting yiddishbookcenter.org backslash events. And while you're on our website, we encourage you to explore the site where you'll find 12,000 Yiddish books. You'll find articles in English. You'll find audio recordings, archival recordings, oral histories, podcasts, and more. Um, so please uh, explore the culture with us online and join us again on Thursday evenings. And before I let you all go, I want to say that you know all of us at the Yiddish Book Center are working really hard remotely uh, as hard as we can to keep Yiddish and Jewish culture alive in the midst of a global pandemic. It's a huge challenge and we hope that you can 
consider giving your support um, by making a tax-deductible contribution. If you'd like to do that, yiddishbookcenter.org backslash donate. Thanks to all of you, our members alike, who support our work. And thanks again to Brett. To all of you, stay healthy, strong, and safe, and join us again. Take care. Um, thank you for the breakfast today, this morning. It was really good. I like the coffee. What was the coffee? Gumption. Currently, we have four members. Me, Ella Fetha Paz, uh, Juan Madrid, a photographer based in Catskills, New York. Um, Carlos Loret de Mola, also based in uh, upstate New York, Hudson Valley. He's a photographer, publisher, um, producer, editor at large. Um, and Alejandro Cartagena, based in Monterey, Mexico. He's a photographer, editor, book publisher, and the creative director of Los Amigos. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. We don't really abide by the ethos of, of uh, nonprofits, so I wouldn't say we have a mission statement. I see us Making a, can, can you repeat the question? As, it's a good question, yeah. I, I wasn't aware that you were going to ask me these kind of questions. It's a collective effort. Everybody in the audience. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm not usually like this. Um, all right, this might be a bold prediction, so bear with me. I see us as becoming one of the top three book publishers in the world. Well, I mean, we're going to start with book publishing, and then that leads to an online magazine, and the online magazine leads to a social media platform, and the, the social media platform leads to a political campaign. The political campaign leads to political office, and so on and so forth. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, we get asked that a lot by a lot of our fans. And every time they ask me, I always tell them, um, it's, you know, it's your imagination. You do what you want with the, your interpretation. But personally, as the writer and architect of the narrative, I do not believe she was murdered. I think that she went on to live in France with a, a lover of hers. And she died uh, of old age in 2081, maybe? Cherry oak uh, dining table. It can sit at least twenty. Think, uh, think Count Dracula. Think of the table that he might have in his uh, abode. These are good questions. These are, you're a funny guy, okay? I don't know who hired you, and I don't know if this is a hit piece, but no, Los well, Healers is not into any sort of shady or illegal activities. I can swear by that. What the fuck is, like, I didn't sign up for this. What the fuck are you guys up to here? Fucking amateur hours is fucking bush league. God damn.
Not really a way to design myself, but I'm trying, slowly, and it's not going to ever finish. So what kind of brief is this? Manifesting. Every day but today, and on multiple astral planes, we are becoming, but at different stages, it happens over and over again, and it will continue to do so. Learn the patterns so you can mutate them, jump them. When I feel the things I feel inside my body, I know that's a becoming that escapes language. It's a feeling I can't place on a mood board. And what's the point of a mood board anyways, if my mood is constantly changing with the manic behavior of the world around me? It's happening inside my body, and that is the truth I know and must honor. I must lean into the question marks and allow those to be the answers for me. My question marks will hold my community. Our collective question marks will be our security blankets, our healing tools. Crying is emotional and so is yelling. Emotions gather on charm bracelets and those charms become the alphabets we use to construct language. I want the language and the charge to express a range of feelings. And from these feelings, a three-dimensional self emerges. This body performs and holds space and counter space and sometimes in the counter space that's where the real work happens. Caliban and the witch, Federici kind of stuff. It's okay for the work to not know what it's doing. That will come someday. Cultivate and tend to your garden. Stop and smell the roses. Tend to those roses. Text them to a friend. Destabilize the notion of the designer as author and start to think of yourself as the compost, which lets the roses grow. From ashes, you will rise and ashes, you will return. It's a beautiful feedback loop against audience and for community. Your friends are everything. Your future friends await. Allow for silence. Silence is important. In silence, we pause. We can hear our hearts beat. Can you hear mine? I want to always hear yours. I want to allow the space to hold others, to be a room like the Quakers. Allow that space to stir the spirits of those in need, and sometimes it'll be you who will raise up that voice. But acknowledge the space first. The voice that needs to be heard will change as the world changes. Just know and feel the energy you bring to a room. Does it preserve? Does it suffocate? Protect? Allow? Be sensitive to what you emit. In our bodies we hold, we pack. We've got these gardens we tend to, these piles that get added to, how do you tend to one's garden that isn't yours? With care. Do your research on organic matter, the lived experience of the seedling, of the tree rings, then ask the questions. Hug the tree, tree hugger. Let the vines cling to the walls of the trellis. Stand back and marvel at nature. At its beautiful knowledge, we can only dream of understanding. So we listen. No masters, no castles, roots, no walls, just floppy grids. Cascading floppy grids. No more drone gaze algorithms. You look into my eyes and mine into yours. What is free does not mean it offers generosity. Question the giver. Question what is being given. Bestowed, but be ever generous because we need that. I feel a transition moving in my body that won't contain to three rounds with feedback. Time in a construct and I want deadlines to stay dead. I won't walk that line or any line. How can we build? How can we shape the space we want to move in? And why is it that we use the language of policing in our education, enforcing policies, enforcing attendance? Can we switch that to a promise of presence? When we come into a space, what do we ask of it? What, do, what does it ask of us? How do we build the space together? Pile the chairs up, sit on the floor, let the space hold as you hold the space. How can we embrace each other without touch? We cannot just hear and see each other, but we must listen and feel and get. It's not enough to think wrong or design wrong or de-skill or unlearn. This is language of disruption and it has been co-opted. Once we make a new wor word, it will be bought and sold and put on a mood board. Can we insist on body language and eye contact, our practice as contact sport? More manifesting, less manifestos, always together. Understand the garden you grow in.
Москва. Московское время 8 часов. Hi everyone, this is Lindsay Buckman from Seton Street Press. I'm here today to talk about the history of the press, our approach to publishing, and to highlight a few projects as part of Printed Matter and Exile Books Publishers Programming for Nada Miami. Before I jump into everything, I just want to say a huge thanks to Printed Matter, the Fairs team for organizing the opportunity for publishers um, to present and also for supporting Seton Street since almost as early as we begin. Um, thank you all, I appreciate it. Seaton Street Press is an artist-run, independent artist books and publications project. I founded the press in 2018 as an artist who was making several artist books and looking to join a community where they would be visible while also beginning a publishing and distribution model for artists in my community in Philadelphia. 
There are a few key influences for the press's model, which is inspired by the history of artist books and the role of printed matter as a leading organization of publications. With deep ties to printmaking, we draw on the history of the printing press as a vehicle for dissemination and its role in democratizing content. Through publishing, we engage with public practice by collaborating with communities, institutions, and artists. This approach is influenced by the forming of publics captured in Michael Warner's Publics and Counterpublics, which teases out the origins of the public sphere in relation to circulation, the mode of address, and textual objects. We are interested in how circulation helps build communities through the form of the book, which can provide agency for those who do not have accessible platforms for individual and collective voice. Like many artist bookmakers today, we are inspired by Ulysses Carrion, who was introduced to us by our friends at Ulysses in Philadelphia when they founded their bookshop as a tribute to the work and legacy of Ulysses Carrion, a Mexican-born poet, conceptualist, and avant-garde artist who was an early pioneer and theorist of the artist book. We identify as an artist book publisher because we love the community of people who are connected to this rich history of experimentation, circulation, and shared appreciation for the book form. We believe in the power of this often tiny object to create meaningful experiences, generating discourse and modes of communication about the conditions of our time. And that is why we continue to publish. We function as a hybrid publishing and distribution model with about half of our projects published in-house and half on consignment for distribution. As a small press, this has allowed us to expand the range of projects we feature. Although we have recently focused on our role as a publisher, releasing three new projects this year. We are also currently working with multiple artists on upcoming publications, and we anticipate the future of the press to continue to be more exclusively focused on publishing. The press is committed to publishing and distributing affordable books. We acknowledge the notion of affordability is subjective, but we intend to produce books in ephemera priced between $10 to $40, with the hope that this range makes publications more widely accessible and with the potential to be more widely distributed. We utilize various methods in printing from in-house risograph printing on our MZ790 duplicator to outsource newspaper printing from Newspaper Club in the UK and digital offset printing from Opero Italia in Italy and Brilliant Graphics nearby in Pennsylvania. Special thanks to our local friend, artist and printer, Josh Sarang for being a friend of the press for many years and supporting several projects through binding and finishing services in Philadelphia. Our titles examine the intersections of sight, language, and memory, including archival histories, social identities, and geographies. The projects we feature are generally connected to temporality, but unique to each artist's lens and approach to making their project. For our program at NADA, we are featuring publications that engage with the politics of identity, migration, and empire, alongside projects that explore the aesthetics of loss, representation, and constructed archives. As part of the history of the press, I just wanted to feature and highlight a few projects, starting with Steph Garcia's De Equipe Para Ya, which we worked on with Steph in 2019 in collaborating to publish her book. De Equipe Para Ya explores familial immigration stories through forms of correspondence and translated audio interviews, using storytelling to examine political struggle and social inequality. Garcia's work calls attention to the plight and challenges families experience while being undocumented, while speaking to the resiliency and strength that runs through the fabric of the Latinx community. Steph's project was printed in-house as a risograph publication and was featured in the classroom during 2020. In late 2020, we worked with Charles Hall to co-publish his newspaper, Ultra, which is a collaboration with Mamie and Weaver's Ultra, a community art space run by Hall in West Philadelphia. Ultra celebrates the legacy of Mamie and Weaver, their family, friends, and neighbors in Belmont, West Philly. Sourced from Hall's family archive, the newspaper features the history of the family's former dry cleaner storefront turned community art space. We released this project in early 2021 for the last virtual fair with an artist talk. So I just wanted to include a clip from that video. This is, uh, this is our first publication. This is volume one of uh, Mamie and Weaver's Ultra. And uh, I'm really, uh, I'm really excited about it, and really appreciate the support of uh, friends and family who have uh, allowed this, uh, allowed this to come to life. We recently released Heather M. O'Brien's book, like the Delayed Rays of a Star, which contemplates the role of the gaze in photography while attempting to pierce the propaganda surrounding U.S.-centric perceptions of Beirut. By resisting a Western gaze, the images aim to question the misplaced anxieties of what it means to grow up in a post-9-11 image landscape, 
to live and work in Lebanon and give birth to one's first child in Beirut on August 4th, the same day as the catastrophic 2020 Beirut explosion. As part of our programming for NADA, we are also featuring O'Brien's work as a separate conversation with the contributors from this project. We also recently released Matt Neff's book, Hyperopia, for the Tokyo Art Book Fair. Hyperopia was printed in-house by the artist. The publication gestures towards a condition of looking forward and backward simultaneously, a present that holds a blurred vision psychologically and metaphorically. In late 2020, we worked with Alina Wong to produce broadsheets of her project Afterlives, a series of images that explore the way a gesture can be preserved, remembered, and altered in the course of remembering and being archived. Wong's project documents the artist's relationship to light, which is uniquely captured in the printed form if you hold these newspapers up to the physical light. While we are open to collaborating with artists from anywhere in the world, many of our projects have been made with artists who are local to Philadelphia. Philly has a long history of artist-run projects, which was also an inspiration for creating an artist-run press. So I wanna end by acknowledging the power of community as a means for publishing, because it has been crucial in sustaining our publishing practice. Mark Fisher gave a talk at the last Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair as part of a panel with Gender Fail and delivered this excellent manifesto for self-sustaining publishing models. It is an impassioned and brilliant rant on so many vital lessons connected to how and why we publish. You can read the entire piece on Half Letter Press's website or pick up a physical copy. All that to say, we are inspired by how publishing brings people together and excited to continue collaborating on projects with artists we admire. Thank you for listening to this short history of Seaton Street Press, our publishing model, publications, and influences as an independent publisher. We hope you enjoy the publisher's programming for NADA Miami. In the fall of 2019, I started working on a new book called Signs to Change Your City. The book tries to reimagine and rethink how we design and build our cities, but thinking about it from the user standpoint. So they're all prints that you can rip out and either frame in your house or post up around your city. They say things like bike lane, bike lane needed, let's petition, accessibility needed, crosswalk required, Please, nothing motorized. Potential art gallery or community space. Outdated zoning laws in effect. With this book, I really tried to look at kind of what are the problems that I'm that we're seeing in cities, and how can I create a book that kind of um, as almost a call to action to create um, change within public spaces. Um, what I didn't know was that I was going to basically finished this book right as the pandemic started. So I kind of sat on it for a while and released it in the fall of 2020. Um, you know, for me, this book is, um, its strength is that it's really trying to, you know, think differently about cities and think about how things could be free and more accessible. Building from Science to Change Your City, I decided that I wanted to do a different book that focused on the environment. Um, this book, Science to Save Your Environment, was all done on 100% post-consumer waste paper, printed using a risograph, and with a 100% recycled cover. So even in the creation of the book, I wanted to be as eco-friendly as I could possibly be while creating a book of signs that functions as kind of reminders uh, for you to kind of, you know, rethink how you're living your life. So not so much looking at uh, grand change, but looking on a very personal level, kind of a one-to-one, -one, you know, signs that would, that you could come across and that would hopefully create some kind of change. 
uh, a lot of the signs um, kind of build on environmental things that have been happening for decades. Um, and I'm hoping that they serve as kind of like reminders for you to, you know, keep advocating for the environment and kind of creating change where you live. Over the last few years, I've also made a lot of books that you would, I would consider uh, kids' books for adults. So I thought it was finally time that I made my own kids' book. This led to Signs for Your Bedroom Door, a coloring book of signs that you can color in and then cut out and put on your bedroom door. A lot of the texts are about kind of asserting your authority as a kid uh, or asserting your own personal space, really. Um, you know, asking to stay up late, um, do not disturb reading in progress, allowance needed, all the signs that kind of um, stake a claim for your own kind of personal space and time. Conceptual oversight and signification through hegemonic substantiation constitute a crisis within this so-called transformation, a crisis of biological renewal and evolution, particularly in the softest, most sublime, or most seductive iterations, where we deny our abilities to switch, encrypt, glitch, and cipher codes. The archive we encounter through these pages overkill taxonomic processes is a symptom of a representational crisis. It is a hostage to the means of representation. What we see is a digitalized personhood in which subjects of mestizaje acquire dignity through hybridization between objects of transgression and luxury. Objects attainable only in a parallel life 
or simulated in the afterlife, the digital life. We understand mestizaje as a catalyzation of the Baroque, one that functions as life expansion, where life becomes a surge of electric substantiation. Mestizaje carries the antidote to its own venom as a force that conducts us to terrible contingencies and cacophonies of turbulent gods, brutality pulsating from the ancient new world. It conceals an irreparable vacuum of permanent volition, where silence and trauma meet as an understanding of the past, yet also a prolonged intravenous warfare. Mestizaje in the post-colony, after the fall of the nation-state into a parallel illegal regime, exists in suspended in rhizomatic relations, primarily when we remember to look back at the margins. The reading of these images is not without a homoerotic gradients, bodies penetrable by all sides. However, these images are not condescending, for they are our own. We are simultaneously the torturer and the mutilated body, free of inferiority and superiority complexes, but also free of the complex of equality. The Artist is Everything. Three Star Books, Paris. Founded in 2007 and based in Paris, France, Three Star Books is owned and managed by Christophe Boutin and Melanie Scarsiglia, with Madalena Quarta overseeing production. Three Star Books produces books and editions with the finest contemporary artists. The term artist's book is interpreted loosely, as the final product often exceeds the physical and conceptual parameters of publishing. The artist is everything. Therefore, the artist book is always at the service of the artist. We bring to the artist our know-how and present a full spectrum of possibilities to choose the most suited techniques to make the artist's vision as close as possible to the desired book. Most of our productions are done in-house, and when that's not possible, we rely on a tight network of skilled international artisans. How we define the page or book is ever-changing. Under the guidance of artist Jonathan Monk, a marbling atelier was assembled at Three Star Book Studio in Paris, where we crafted large format, unique marbled papers that were bound together in order to create the artist's latest Three Star Books project entitled The End. Our books have to be handled and discovered physically. Witnessing the visceral reactions that are experienced when encountering our artist book editions for the first time is evident in proving that craftsmanship is all the more important in our digital age. While our atelier serves many functions, it is at heart our studio for assembling works and a showroom for presenting completed projects. Here, we also invite the artists to present their finished projects in context exhibiting their Three Star Books edition alongside other works from their studio. We recently completed two new books, Rafaela Della Olga's Lineup and Rafael Rosendahl's Home Alone. Very different in their forms, these two new projects perfectly illustrate our craft and capacities to work with our artists to make books as true works of art.
Hasta luego. Hola. Hola, ¿cómo están? Buen día. ¡Salgo, tele! ¡Salgo, yo gano! ¡Yo gano! Hasta ahí, hasta ahí.